Hello and a good morning, good afternoon, and a very good evening to you, the good and wonderful people of YouTube. Hope you're all today. Hope you're doing grand and all as well in your world. Hello there, everybody. If you're wondering why I'm talking weird, I've just been to a dentist for fillings, and this entire side of my face is numb now. And I thought it might be quite amusing to try and get for an A and Q Wednesday with a numb face. Anyway. Hello everybody. So anyway, let's, uh, uh, if you, before I get started actually, if you want to submit a question for A&Q Wednesday, please go to the description box below. There's an email link down there. Okay, so uh, anyway, let's get to question one today. And if I dribble, I do apologise. I think I am dribbling. I am dribbling already. Okay. Uh, okay, and there's certain words I can't say, so this is going to be hysterical. Anyway, hopefully it will give you a good giggle. Okay, so anyway, uh, so question one today is... Um, I'd like to know your opinion about the interwa- interaction. I've turned into Jonathan Ross. That's what these injections were. They were Ross injections. Anyway, I'd like, I'd like to know your opinion about the interaction uh, between the Golden Plexi and Triungulo Labs uh, Ensemble Crunch, which I own, slash Past, Ef uh, past Effects Chorus Ensemble. Uh, I guess it, uh, if running them both could bring some improvement in John for Shanty Tone. Um... Uh, I'd never got the Triangle Labs Chorus Ensemble to work. It didn't work for me. Uh, the um, Past Effects Chorus Ensemble did work, but I still needed my Jackhammer or the Golden Plexi pedal as well. And that's an exact... And Because uh, you're saying about John Frusciante, and that's exactly how John... I didn't mute my phone. That's exactly how John runs his. His amps are still on the edge of breakup. So you've still got Edge of Breakup Tone combined with the preamp of the CE1 uh, slash Past Effects slash Triangle Labs, whichever one you've got. So running both together, yeah, they will give you um, a bit more of that kind of thing. But you can, yeah, you can still kind of get away with just using a Golden Plexi or a Marshall Jackhammer. Uh, you just got to run it a tad brighter uh, because the uh, CE1, what I found, not only does it kind of add a bit more kind of like poke, but it also adds a bit of brightness that's kind of like very unique to it, if that makes any sense. Uh, so it's kind of like really weird. Um, but yeah, I mean, you don't necessarily need it, but it's nice to have it if you've got it. But like I said, I, I couldn't get the triangle that wants to work with mine. Um, it just didn't, it didn't behave. It, it, it just didn't behave very well. And um like I say, it kind of it kind of upset me to be honest. With you. I was like, "Why does it not work?" And I was messaging Will, and I was like, "Why is it not working?" Anyway, um, but uh, the past effects one, I, I've never had any issues with that one. I, I, I love that one. That's really really cool. Um, you know, it's 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 just really cool. I love the chorus sounds of the and and the uh, vibrato sounds really really cool, and the preamp's really nice as well. And I like I I do like the past effects one a lot more. I don't know why. I just find it more. Like, so not only for the fact I can get it to work, but like it, it just feels better. Like uh, when I when I did use the triangle lab ones, like, it was really really good. Don't get me wrong, but I just prefer th the feel of the past effects one. Just feels better. It really does. Um, and I say, but, and, but I still have to combine it. If I use it as standalone, I get volume jumps on the DS one and the Ibanez Wah. and uh, so um, you still have to have that kind of edge of breakup thing either from your amp or from a pedal. So anyway, uh, so yeah, I hope that's your question for what it is. I hope there's some kind of. Uh, but I know, in all fairness, I, I I did a video a bit ago now about John Fashanti's tone, uh, tone talk or whatever it was, and uh, I talk about it more in there. So no. Um, so no, I hope that's question. We move on to question two now. I can start to fit his feet. Oh, by the way, Queenie's behind the camera because she just wants to laugh at me. I can hear her laughing already. And uh, it's, it's starting to come back now. I can start to feel my, I start to feel it coming back, but it's still quite amusing. This is me smiling. Like Clint Eastwood or Elvis. Oh, oh, oh. Anyway, Elvis injections. Elvis and Jonathan Ross combined to make one superpower, Elvis Ross. God help the world. Anyway. Moving on to question two, before I get too distracted by the image of an Elvis Jonathan Ross. I got distracted by the image of Elvis Jonathan Ross. Anyone wants to do a Photoshop of that, go ahead. Okay, so anyway, stop dribbling, Davey. Okay, so moving on, question two. Uh, question two today has two parts. 
So question two, part one, is please solve the mystery of how to set pickup heights, however you want. It's up to you, it's personal preference. There's no law, no rules, no, it's got to be this way, got to be that way, got to be da 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 None of that, it's literally however you want them to be set. Uh, I have my pickups really low. Uh, the only guitar I have my pickups high on is my Telecaster. I don't know why, it just, that's the way I want them. And they're like this, on the Telecaster, literally, but the, the, um, the bridge pickup on my Telecaster is literally like this, the high E, B and G are here, and then the E, A and D are down here, so the pickups, the back, the bridge pickup especially is like really slanted, and the neck pickup is pretty much the same as well, uh, and I have slanted pickups on all my guitars, apart from my Les Pauls, uh, and all Gibson style guitars, or guitars with humbuckers. But I have these really low. I don't know how you well set. I'm, I, see, I had to turn the LCD screen around because I couldn't stand to look at my face because I was just laughing at it constantly. But hopefully you can kind of see here on the jet how low those pickups are. Uh, and the reason I have them so low is that, like I said, I just want the guitar to be as clean as possible. I don't like the pickups to be high and overdrivey um, to kick the amp in the face. I don't like that. I like pedals to do that instead of the guitar. Uh, but there is no right or wrong way. There is no right or wrong height. I mean, it, there, there is obviously issues you will run into if you get the pickups too high because their magnetic pull will start pulling on the strings and you'll get like um, like weird overtones and all sorts of kind of like like beats and weird stuff that happening that you don't want. So obviously you don't want them like, you know, just literally below the strings, which is like, I've seen, I've seen some people do that before. I mean, you can do that with stuff like lace sensors. Like, yeah, if they're a lace sensor kind of pickup, you can get them really, really high. But if they're kind of pole piece pickups, I will not really recommend it because you're going to get all sorts of weird overtones and strange noises, and I wouldn't really recommend doing that. Um, but like I say, there are no rules. Do it however you want. Experiment. Uh, uh, I have I just set my pickups to basically what my white strap, Mr. White, was set up to when I got it. When I got that strap, my the pickups on that guitar were really low, especially the neck pickup. I'd never seen pickups that low. I didn't really know anything about pickups at the time. I didn't even know what a floating trem was or anything. Uh, much of the annoyance of me when I broke a string with a floating trem and then realised the guitar goes wild out of tune and I didn't have a backup at a gig and that was fun. Anyway, but um, I had no idea that you could alter these things. I, I, I was too afraid to even try. Uh, it was 2004 when I got that guitar. And I ain't got into delving into kind of like messing around with things too much at that point. Um, so um, it's just whatever you want. Just experiment. Again, too high might will cause too, issue, too many issues. But like, you know, really low, medium, kind of high height is, you know, but not too high, is, um, is kind of where you want to be. I've just noticed there's some very, very strange gunk on this guitar. What is that? That is disgusting. I hope that isn't like something alien that's going to infect me it could be for all i know i don't know it looks like someone's been playing this and it isn't me because i haven't been here to play it they shall reap the whirlwind anyway moving along so yeah if there is no rules okay moving along to part two of question two um uh, i bought some 70s h and h amps uh, VS Musician 100 watt head and 100 watt combo. Have you ever used them and do they place alongside modern amps? Uh, yeah, I have used H&H um, &H amps. We used, I just, I just kind of like got my lips stuck in my teeth. Um, I, we had quite a lot of H&H &H, H &H amps in old hat. Uh, we had some heads. I used to have a PA head as well that I, I actually gave uh, a H&H &H 100 watt PA head to old hat. Because the owner had got the two dual concentric uh, speaker cabinets, but no PA head, and so I said, "I'll, I'll, I'll give you. I'll, I won't give, give, but I thought I'll donate my H and H PA head to complete the look, so it's on show, so it, it, it's, it's the whole set. But because these things weren't for sale, these things were just kind of like to show they were going to go in a museum. And uh, I gave my H and H head to the shop for a, like on loan, if you will. And uh, never got it back. It's probably still there for all I know, but it's uh, I never got it back. Hey ho! Anyway, um, but yeah, H and H amps. I'm not a fan of at all. We had one in old hat that when you played for it, it made you feel sick. 
and I wish that was a, a lie, but it actually wasn't. The tonality of this one amp made everyone who ever played for it feel like they were going to throw up, and I don't know why. <laughs> But, like, and again, I'm not lying people to you, this is God's honest truth. But, like, literally, whenever you played for it, you just like, oh, why is that affecting me? I remember at one point, I had to go outside after playing for it just to get some fresh air because I felt like I was going to throw up. It was really grim. And I don't know why. I, um, it was fully serviced, it fully worked, but it was just dodgy. And there was something wrong with that one. Uh, none of the others did it. Uh, none of the other H and H's did it. Uh, it was just that one, the Vom amp. Um, hey, do you want to be sick? Play through the amp. Imagine using that at a gig and just your entire audience just starts going everywhere. It'd be like some kind of weird scene. What's that? What's that film where they all start throwing up on each other? I don't know. Oh, is it Stand by Me? I don't know. There's a weird scene in Stand by Me, I think, where he's like this, this guy starts to make everybody throw up. It's disgusting. Anyway, or Team America, where he's in the back alley. Anyway. Um, but yeah, I didn't really like them. We had a couple of H&H uh, &H amps. We had the other ones as well that had the effects pedals that came with them. So you had like a fuzz and uh, I think an echo or something like that. I don't actually remember what. A phaser, sorry. And there was these like massive block pedals that like clicked together in like a weird kind of duplo kind of like way. And uh, they were just... They were just never really the sound I liked. Uh, I never really got on with them. I know people like Mark Bolin used them quite a lot. And you see quite a lot of people using H&H &H heads. Um, Eric Bell of Finn Lizzy used a H&H &H head. I've seen Brian Robertson of Finn Lizzy using a H&H &H head. So Mark Bolin's probably the most well-known guy for using H&H. &H, but other than that, not a lot of people did. There, there's, there's quite a few. Uh, who else? Uh, I'm pretty sure I saw Paul Kossoff with one. But I could be wrong. It could have been, like, what was there at the time. But, um, but again, in all fairness, I would like to give one no give one another go at some point. But, again, I'm not rushing out to find one. If one comes up, cool. But if not, I'm not, I'm not that fussed. But I never really liked them as, in myself. Uh, do they have a place alongside modern amps? They definitely have a place alongside modern amps, yes. Um, I always thought, because, because they did all the T-Rex records, they've got that sound. You know, they really do sound like... A, you know, if you put a Les Paul into those things, you've got Mark Bolan, really. You have... And they've got this really distinctive tone that's really cool that um, only those amps really have. They're like a Vox sound. Like, you know, they, 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 they sound like they sound. Um, you know, like some of these old amps, they just have a distinctive tone to them that no other amp has but them. And the H&Hs &H are no different to that. Um... But yeah, so um, they definitely have a place. You know, if you, if you love them and you love them, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who really, really like those kind of things. I mean, there's uh, there's the Sun Beta amp as well, which I really want to try one of those. I've never actually tried one of those. But, um, you know, they, 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 were, they were really, really cool uh, amps. I, I love the way they look. They look so kind of like of their time. But at the same time, extremely futuristic. Especially when you turn them on and you get that entire like glow on a green glow on the, on the entire front panel. But I remember we had one. Uh, it wasn't the sick amp. It was another amp we had of theirs. It was a two per twelve combo, and it was heavier than a Fender Super Reverb. I was it, it, literally, I'm, I, we were so happy it was on wheels, and we're so happy no one ever wanted to play for it because it was buried, and we never wanted to get it out because it was just too heavy. Um, but they, yeah, they have definitely a place. All these old amps have places, you know what I mean? They, they, you know, just because we're living in a world of Kemper and, and, and Axe Effects and all this kind of plug-in stuff, it doesn't mean that these, these amps are kind of obsolete, because they're really not. They're really not. But there's, there's so many gems out there, you know, to be had. I mean, look at this thing. It's Rickenbacker here. Like, you know, I wouldn't say for one minute this amp is redundant, uh, because it isn't. Oh, this Marshall, the Marshall strip amp, is that redundant? No. No, of course they're not. They're amazing. Yeah, they, they've got their own little character, which I love. Anyway, um, but yeah, they definitely got a place. Okay, so uh, moving along to question three. Now, question three today is... Well, question three's got three parts to it. Three, 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 three. Okay, question three. Pa with three parts. It's got three parts for question three. <laughs> I'm putting that on now, people. Anyway... Put the jet down, Dave. No, I don't want to. Okay, <laughs> okay so uh, question three: uh, Did John ever use? Did John Fashanti ever use a fuzz face? <laughs> I 
It was going to happen, wasn't it? Let's be honest. <laughs> got, you, you've got question three. Three parts for Shanty and Fuzz Face. Oh, it was a long speech. Anyway, uh, but yeah, I, I've read an interview uh, where he said he did around the Blood Sugar Sex Magic era. Uh, no, probably no doubt. You know, probably John... He, he, I've never seen John use one live, but in the studio, most probably. He's used pretty much everything else. Um, you know. So, yeah, most probably. I, I would find it very hard to believe he hasn't tried a full face being a John, uh, being a Jimi Hendrix knot. I know he said a John Vashanti knot. Is John Vashanti a John Vashanti knot? I don't know. Let's find out. Let's go and ask him. Anyway, uh, moving along. But, yeah, being such a Jimi Hendrix knot, he'd have to try a full face, wouldn't he? Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. He's he's probably used one uh, on on other albums as well. You know what I mean? I know he used quite a lot of fuzz. I knew I know he used this fuzz quite a lot. Again, being a Jimi Hendrix fan, but yeah, wouldn't surprise me. Okay, so uh, part uh, uh, two. I'm starting to get feeling back, so I can feel when my hair goes in my mouth. Uh, qu- uh, question three, part two. Is uh, I was watching Red Hot Chili Peppers live at the Houston Field House in 1991. I noticed that instead of turning off his DS2 on things like uh, "Suck My Kiss" chorus, he would just turn his guitar, turn off his guitar volume. How can he do with that loud hiss of the DS2? Simple. He doesn't. His amp still hiss. Uh, what year is that? 91. Um. His amps will still be making noise. You just won't be able to hear it because it's a live gig. You've got Chad playing over the top and you've got ambient noise. The only re- you know, uh, if I turn my DS2 on in here, you can hear it hissing away. But when I turn it on at a gig, you can't hear it because there's, 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 there's people talking, there's ambient noise, there's noise from the drums, there's noise from elsewhere. You won't be able to hear it, you know. And um, so... Well, that's the end of that, isn't it, people? Too, but uh, you know, it's just it's over. <laughs> it's over now. Interruptions from Queenie on her phone. I was trying to like your video because my phone just told me about it. It's nice to see the YouTube YouTube algorithm working great there, isn't it? <laughs> it's only what twenty four hours later. Yay! <laughs> Walden algorithm, you are brilliant. Moving along. Anyway, where was I? Let's get back to the question. Let's reverse. So yeah, it'll get a lot. There's a lot of ambient noise at a gig, so you won't necessarily hear all the buzzing and all the craziness of John's DS2. Uh, you'll be able to just roll his volume down. Uh, a good one for hearing background noise is Bizarre Fest in 1999. If you go to the Red Hot Chili Peppers Bizarre Fest 1999 and go to Suck My Kiss, you can hear John's amps buzzing there. And John's amps will always buzz. They're valve amplifiers, you know. Uh, they're not, you know, every amp buzzes, and John's, because they're running so high, will be hissing and buzzing. You just won't hear it over ambient noise. It'd be very interesting, again, to hear John's sound. I've spoken about this in a video I did while back. Uh, very interested in hearing John's sound in the room to see how quiet his setup actually is because it's like uh, Joe Bonamassa is an example. When you hear like recordings of Joe Bonamassa, like on on YouTube or a gig or this that and the other, his amps you don't hear any amp noise. You don't hear any going to, mm, or or any of that. You don't hear any of that noise. But if you watch the rig rundown of Joe Bonamassa when he's demoing his uh, high power twins and his dumbbells. When he turns them all off, it plays goes silent. But when he turns them on, they all buzz and hum. It's just the, it's a noise that these things make. So when John's got his DS2 on, it'll the noise will still be there. He just won't be able to. It won't be audible because of the you know you've got a crowd of many thousands of people screaming. Uh, you've got Chad playing. Excuse me. You've got ambient noise of stuff going on around. You, you've got everything, you know. You've got to take that into consideration. He, you know, he, he's not playing in a quiet room where every little noise can be heard. You know, it's 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 not one of those things. Um, so yeah, so but just bear that in mind. That's how he that's how he does that. Uh, and again, if he's just got the DS2 on, it's not particularly 
a loud hiss. Unless, you know, especially 991, uh, John, was really over, uh, John was only really using the DS1 for distortion. Uh, he wasn't using it with a fuzz pedal like he does nowadays. So with that sound, it, it's not going to be kind of, it's not going to go particularly crazy at all. So, um, but it still will be there. You just won't be able to, you won't audibly be able to hear it. So it'll just, it'll blend into the background. Okay, so uh, last part of question three today is, um, oh, uh, it's not, it's not. Uh, that was just a, an extra added on bit that I'm very, very grateful for. So thank you very much indeed for the person who asked this question. Okay, so uh, moving on now to uh, question four. So question four today, part one. Again, we have uh, six parts to question four. Uh, question, and it's quite apt. She's behind the camera because it's about her. So question one today, uh, question four, part one today is, uh, where did you meet Queenie? Uh, and do you guys live together? No, 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 she lives outside somewhere. She likes the bins. I don't know what's wrong with her. Like, I keep kind of go, <laughs> keep going outside and finding a Rujan in bins. He doesn't feed me. I definitely do. Well, apart from the other night when I tried to make something really good and totally failed at it, and we just had to have chips. Because I, I had a bit of a breakdown. I, I was really looking forward to this meal. I was going to make Cajun chicken. And it was going to be amazing with rice and, you know, peppers. And and I made it and it was literally garbage. <laughs> it's the kind of stuff you wouldn't feed to... Me. Sorry, I just had to stop Queenie from trying to dive in the bins again. She, she was like, she was trying to get out the window. And like, we we're, were like one floor up here. So but, you know, it's a bell of a job. But she saw the bins and just went for it. She's like, it's like a rabid animal when she gets like that. It's like, bins! It was all that naff food you threw out that you tried to cook. Yeah, well, actually, I, I, there is a point in people achieve. I, I, like, I was like, I, got you, I can't eat this food, it's garbage. But Queen is like, I could eat it. I actually could eat it, but it was extremely spicy. Yeah, well, because it, it was crap. <laughs> I like your cooking. Yeah, I, 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 I know why I was stressed. Stress people with YouTube is literally the worst thing in the world because it just ruins everything. Keep your stress levels low. Try to at least. It's really hard in this day and age because the world has just gone mental. But try to keep your stress levels low. Anyway, how did I meet Queenie? Um, so we met through John Joe, the drummer of the Dave Simpson Trio. Um, when I came back from France... Uh, I messaged John Joe uh, because I think I'd been offered a gig and uh, I messaged John Joe saying, do you think you can find a bass player? Funny enough, um, I asked him about this bass player who stood in with a trio before and John Joe, John Joe said, well, let me see if I can find somebody a bit more, well, semi-permanent at that point, somebody who could depth, depth for the gig. And I was like, okay, no worries. Uh, uh, so I let John Joe just kind of left him to kind of do that and I got, he got, an e I got a message from him couple of days later he says oh what about this person and i clicked on it and uh it was queenie i didn't didn't know i'd later be calling her queenie at the time it was cc base or cctv <laughs> which is what i need to keep her out of the bins <laughs> anyway bin tv with queenie anyway uh so yeah so i looked at this video and it was queenie playing nobody weird like me the chili peppers song and I actually messaged John Joe back saying, no, she's too good, find somebody else. <laughs> Which to this day is kind of like, what? Anyway, John Joe kind of like, but I was in kind of like this law state because in all fairness, I was kind of at the same time in the mood to want to do the trio again. At the same time, I was like, I don't want to do the trio again because I was just like, I've had enough of band drama. I'd had so much of it with the, with the trio. Because John Joe's like John Joe's the fifth drummer, and Queenie's the seventh bassist, which is which is, which is quite cool. Because seven is Queenie's favourite number, so that's really really weird and coincidental, or what? Or are there no coincidences? Who knows? Anyway, um, but yeah, anyway, John Joe kind of taught me around to do it because I said I was kind of sick of it. To be honest, I was kind of like, I've had enough of trying to get gigs. I still am. I've, I'm still. I'm sick of trying to get gigs. Trying to get gigs in this day and age, especially now, is even harder because of everything. Um, it's mental. It's just really difficult. So we do struggle still. I mean, we've we've got a couple of gigs this year. I'll, I'll be posting gig dates. I probably already have posted gig dates, but I'll post them again. But anyway, John Joe said, "No, go 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 with it. Go with it, and we'll we'll get we'll just get a jam sorted." 
So I was like, okay, fair enough. And um, we got a date sorted. And uh, I remember being like massively nervous about the jam session because I was a bit like, oh no, what, what if it's really bad? <laughs> so I was a bit scared of it. But um, and I thought what I would do is, my brain kind of like, I was thinking about it night before, and I thought what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to throw her into the deep end. Like, because when me and John Joe play, uh, we're, we're, we're very kind of improvisational. We don't tend to stick to things too much, really, unless the song requires it. Uh, so if we do something like Voodoo Child, it can invariably last maybe 10 to 15 minutes, depending. And we'll go through loads of different things, and it'll just jam. And a lot of people don't and aren't comfortable with that kind of thing. And also, we don't really rehearse a lot. We like to just kind of, like, fly by the seat of our pants, so to say. And... Um, so I thought, well, this is going to be a thing. So let's let, let let's let's throw her in at the deep end and see how she can do. So we we um we got this rehearsal booked. I remember being dead nervous because thinking like, you know, what if it doesn't work and I have to tell her no? Because I haven't got that in me to be horrible like that. It, it just feels right. I hate telling people no. Like everybody's been in the trio before that I've had to let go. Like apart from one person, uh, has been really really difficult to like let go of but um i'm not naming names but uh yeah that was worth it six years anyway uh moon alone um uh but yeah so and we got to this rehearsal and she turned up and uh i thought okay so we took we were, we were nattering a bit and i said oh we play an e flat and she already knew that because she'd done her research and i was like that's a good sign because sometimes you get, you know, if you're not doing your research and you go for like a uh, an audition with a band and you're not doing your research and they say, oh, by the way, we're in this tuning. And you say, oh, oh, really? I didn't even notice. It's not a good sign, is it, to that band? Like, you know, you're not, you're not going to be in prime position there. Um, but, uh, but anyway, Queenie already knew. And I said, okay. And I said, well, what do you want to do? And we were like, dumbing an hour in. And I literally just went and started Voodoo Child. Uh, slight return. And, um... Literally, everything I have I and John Joe threw at her that day, she just took it. Like, I like yeah, and just went with it. It was insane. Like, I was like, I can't... And I was trying to outfox her. Not to be horrible, but I was trying to make her mess up and see where I could push her and see where... I, see what... Like, mm, it's, like, it's like, hmm, let's see what she can do. I remember Bruce Dickinson saying this about Nico McBrain. When Nico McBrain joined Iron Maiden, they were like, ooh, he does this, and he does this. I wonder what else he can do. Let's find out. And it felt like that. I was like, I wonder what else she can do. And literally, there wasn't anything that kind of like came along that she couldn't do. And it was like, that's pretty much sorted that one then, hasn't it? So that's how we came to meet each other, know each other and stuff like that. So yeah, and uh, now I beat her up every day. <laughs> Joking, she beats me up. I was really See this nervous. black eye? Yeah, yeah, cool, yeah. Um... Hello. Yeah, I was extremely nervous. Wow, she's just in the black hole of Calcutta. I keep saying that today. <laughs> this wasn't worth it, was it? I'm still in my pyjamas. Come, come over here with me. <laughs> so what? <laughs> pyjamas are good, aren't they, people? Who are <laughs> so, yes. So, um, so, yeah. Yeah, I was extremely nervous uh, when I turned up to do that and in the run-up. So, I'm really glad that I could actually take everything you threw at me because... This band is the first band I've ever been in that actually, one, I'm allowed to kind of improvise in, and two, that actually does that thing, like, most of the time. So that was literally, that rehearsal and that jam session was my first time properly doing anything like that. So I'm glad it worked out. <laughs> yes. So are we. And so am I. Anyway. Uh, yeah, but yeah, there she goes. Bye. Back to the bins. <laughs> so... Back to me, my, back to my gorgeous face. I'm sure you'd like to see my face more than Queenie's, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, right. Who would want that? Not even me. Okay, so anyway. But yeah, that's how we met. Uh, and then basically, you know, um, things went from there, to, from there to all places. And now she's raiding my bins. Uh, after the Cajun chicken that I ruined. Anyway, moving along. So yeah, that's it, really. Um, I think that's it for, uh, for part one of question four. Um, but yeah, do we live together? But basically, yeah, we, we kind of to and fro between my house here and Queenie's house, which is the other room you've seen. Um, where did the nickname come from? Uh, the nickname came from uh, Queenie. It came from, well, it comes from like 
our love of Blackadder for a start, but it was a que- basically, I, I, I think it was after a rehearsal once. We were sat in your mum's car, weren't we? We were just yeah. nattering away. Um, and I don't really remember how it came to be, but it was kind of like I was. We were talking, and I was like, "Oh, you're such a qu- like a queenie," because she was like, "Oh, I want this," and I did a little bit. She's been a very kind of like. Like she's very kind of like royal and hey, look at me. On purpose. On I'm purpose. Not yeah, like she's that. no, she's not. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, she was like, she was just like playing it up basically, and I was like, oh, you're such a queenie, aren't you? And I just kind of stuck because again, queenie from Blackadder as well. So, you know, um, she's literally nothing like queenie in Blackadder. But I like the name, and it just kind of stuck. And I don't really know why. And I tend to call her queens as well. But uh, but no, that, that's where it came from basically. Uh, so yeah, anyway, I'm gonna move on to uh, so enough about the bin dwelling creature. She's gonna beat me up later. Don't just not the eye. I don't have enough makeup to cover it. This is all makeup, people. Are too under here. I'm like, I you know, this wasn't dentistry, by the way. She's just actually smashed my face in this moment. Anyway, it wasn't the dentist at all. She just beat me mercilessly. I'll never get over the Cajun chicken. Anyway! Okay, so part two of question four today. You burn my tea, boy! The beating I got that night moulded me as a man. <laughs> Literally. Yes, look at my face. It was out here. Anyway, moving along. So, uh, yeah. Um, so question two is... Uh, oh, here you go. Here's a question for you as well, Queenie. And a question for you, people tube. Why not? Uh, what is your opinion on the band Cream? Do you like Jack Bruce? Okay, now, as a fellow bassist in the room, come back here, you. Oh, God, I wasn't expecting. I know, neither was I, but hey, why not, while you're here. Uh, so, the band Cream. Uh, they're, yeah, I mean, they're good. They're not really on my radar as a band I listen to, but they even have some good songs. But again, they're not really on my radar. But Jack Bruce, uh, mental bass player. How would you say? What do you I mean? Do you know much about Mr. Jack? Um, I don't. I'm not an expert on him, but what I've heard of him, I really like, and I really admire the ways he pushed the bass. Mm. Um, so I would say I'm a fan of his playing, but I'm definitely no expert on him. As yeah. for the band Cream, um, I like what I've heard of them, and for me, they're quite nostalgic because my dad played them when I was growing up. So, yeah, but I don't know loads of their stuff. Yeah, uh, you might as well stay there. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I'll tell you what. See, now, isn't that better? No. <laughs> so, yeah, I I like Cream as well, but... Um, but again, I don't listen to them a great deal. Uh, you know, they're just not really a band that's on my radar from that era. You know, they're not, they're not going to pit Jimmy to the post or Rory or, or Deep Purple or anything like that. But uh, songs I do like... Um... I think my favourite is White Room. Like, I think my favourite Cream song is White Room. Um, especially the uh, Reunion Royal Albert Hall version. That was amazing. Eric, Eric Clapton's guitar solo, and that is just outrageous. But again, yeah, Jack Bruce is an amazing bassist. Um, again, like you said, he really pushed the, the idea of being like a lead bass. Kind of like, you know, there's a lot of improvisation in his playing. Um... But yeah, again, as much as it, people might crucify me for this one, I prefer Andy Fraser, the free. Uh, I love his bass playing a lot more. I don't, you know, there's just something more to Andy's playing that wasn't there with uh, with Jack. I mean, Jack bass playing is, Jack's bass playing is really, really good, but Andy Fraser's bass playing is phenomenal in my book. I mean, it, it's just, um, I find kind of like, um, Andy Fraser's playing a little bit more inventive. Well, not inv- maybe that's the wrong word, but I just like how he wrote songs and and, and his bass sat and the way he moved around and his bass solos in like songs like um, Mr. Big and stuff like that are just insanely good. And again, Andy Fraser was one of those bass players who's way ahead of his time, way ahead of his time. But yeah, um, but yeah. I mean, uh, what do you think of Andy Fraser, Queen? I love him. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, basically what you said. What he said. <laughs> Not saying you're a he, you know, but anyway. Don't go in the bins. There's rats in there. <laughs> I put them in there to keep you out. <laughs> anyway, uh, his name's uh, Clive, and he's got big arms. You should see his tail. 
No, oh, no. It was disgusting. I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, that wasn't a euphemism. I actually meant the tail. <laughs> anyway, I'm getting silly. Okay, so, um, but yeah, uh, I do like Cream. You also said, like, you know, what do you think of Eric's Wawa playing? I think Eric's Wawa playing is extremely... Um, what's the word when it's unrefined? Uh, it, it, it's it's cool, but it, it it's just this. He's just wow, wow. He's just wiring it. It, it. There's no real technique to why Eric's doing what he's doing with it. Like there are certain things he'll do this anyway, but it was just an effect. He what he, he wasn't using it like Jimi Hendrix used it, where it come, becomes part of the playing. It was an effect, you know, Jimmy. Jimmy took the wah pedal to the next level. He really did. And in all fairness, I don't think you can go, you can really take the wah pedal any further than Jimi Hendrix, personally. But again, I'll give Eric his due. You know, I mean, it, it still works. And it's really cool. But again, it is just... Um, but you can see why, when Jimmy started using the wah pedal the way Jimmy started using it, why Eric never used one ever again. <laughs> yeah. He was like, yep, that's done. I think he even says that. Anyway... So, uh, so yeah, uh, we're going to move on to uh, part three of question four now. Uh, do you like Bob Dylan? Jimi Hendrix was a massive fan, as we know. Indeed, yeah, I love Bob Dylan, yeah. Uh, one of my favourite Bob Dylan songs was uh, is um, Blind Billy McTell. And it's a song that no one ever seems to know by him. I'm like, oh, I'm like, people go, oh, what's your favourite Bob Dylan song? I go, oh, it's Blind Billy McTell. And people are like, what's that? I'm like... How do you not? Oh my god! And then, but, but then I get the like the joy of showing them for a the first time. It's an amazing. If you haven't heard of it, you put in uh, Bob Dylan, uh, B- uh, Blind, Blind William McTell. It's literally one of the best Bob Dylan songs I've ever heard. I'd love it, and his voice in it is amazing. So uh, yeah, I do love Bob Dylan. Do you love Bob Dylan, Queenie? Oh, I like Bob Dylan. Yeah. People who have tube, do you love Bob Dylan? Let us know in the comment section below. And if you don't, why? And if you do, why? Let us know. Uh, but I do love Bob Dylan. Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of, like, you know, that kind of folk... I mean, I don't listen to it a great deal, but I'm a big fan of that kind of folk stuff anyway. Uh, and obviously his latest stuff, his electric stuff as well. Uh, I definitely wouldn't have been one of those people at the Newport Folk Festival booing him because he's playing electric guitars. Um, but I do love his folky stuff. It's really, really gorgeous. But again, like, you know, you, you got some amazing... Some of those amazing electric songs, especially with, like, um, like Bloomfield on guitar and stuff like that. It's amazing. Uh, but yeah, I do love Bob Dylan. Wow. That was the wind. It made the floor rumble. Do you feel <laughs> yeah. that? Oh, what, what storm are we on now? Storm 167 million <laughs> thousand. And this one's called Kevin. Storm Kevin. We've been through the alphabet five times yeah. now. It's uh, Storm Kevin Costner. Because <laughs> it's going to cost you a lot of money. Just like Waterworld. Anyway... Moving along, <laughs> so I hope answers that question anyway. Um, uh, I think you should start appearing in every A and Q Wednesday. What do you think, Pooja? This is a lot more fun having somebody else on camera, especially not, somebody who looks a lot be- better than I do. I'm not sure I want to know people's answers to that. One. You're about to find out. <laughs> okay, so um, so uh, part four of question four today is: uh, Do you like '60s American groups, uh, The Birds, Spoonful, Buffalo Springfield, Jefferson Airplane? Uh, yeah, again, do like them, but don't listen to them a great deal. But I do love people like Jeff- Jefferson Airplane. I love love them. They're probably my favourite out of that list. But um, don't really listen to them a great deal, to be honest with you. But yeah, they are very, very cool. Queenie, over to you. Jefferson Airplane are my favourite ones as well. And there's a song I really want to show Dave, so you guys remind me to show him. <laughs> yeah, cool. So yeah, um, but yeah, I don't really listen to a great deal of a lot uh, of bands from that like, era, like of that kind of type, if you will, but yeah, they are cool. Okay, moving along, uh, question uh, question four, part five. Uh, do you have any thoughts on Mike Bloomfield? I just mentioned Mike Bloomfield uh, and his playing and techniques and sound. Uh, yeah, the man was a monster. I love that the guitar was like this high on him and he just dug in like a demon. Uh, I don't know much about him. Again, like Queenie said, he's got a great effect. I'm not an expert and I'm really not, but I have dove into his playing and he's playing his ace, uh, and I love his tone, and his techniques are great. Yeah, he just really digs in. I prefer his sound with a Telecaster to the Les Paul, but that's me. Uh, but, um, but yeah, really, really cool. Can you feel, feel the floor yeah. rumbling? It's like I feel like the house is going to fall it's, it's down. It's kind of off-putting. Like, it is, it's quite unnerving. The video. <laughs> everything's fine, everything's fine. <sighs> Savannah. Savannah. 
That's our term in the days of Centurion to calm down people who are tubing. It comes from a banjo name. I have a banjo down downstairs that's called... Uh, his, his make is Savannah, and um, I don't know how that came to it, be. I think it was John Joe. Dave was getting really stressed out about something. I've surprise, surprise. Um, <laughs> we're nothing alike. Yes. Uh, and John Joe read the name. I was like, Dave, Dave, just Savannah. Savannah. So people with the tube, if you get stressed... Savannah. Someone's going to remix that. Savannah. Savannah. <laughs> See, without a remix, now I've done it. Um, but yeah, like my Bloomfield. Again, not a guitarist on my radar, but great player. Love his sound. Like I say, I like his sound with a Telecaster a lot more than the Les Paul, personally. But the man's a beast. And again, head of his time. Really cool. Okay, so um, finally, number uh, part six of question four. Opinions on Mitch Mitchell, beside being awesome. Yeah, that's it. You've just summed it up. Awesome. Mitch, next to Mr. John Joe Gaskin, uh, is my favourite drummer ever in the world. Uh, I just love the way Mitch played. I just... It just... The man's a deep... The man was the Jimi Hendrix of drums to me. Uh, I know there's a lot of people who would like, you know, a lot of other drummers around that era, but to me, Mitch is the one. And I know Queenie's going to uh, argue a point on a certain other drummer. No, 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 I actually agree with you. Really? Uh, he's kind of on a par on a personal level. Yeah. But on a musicianship level, that feels like the wrong way to put it. But I love Keith Moon on a really personal level. Mm-hmm. But I would say I agree with your point on Mitch Mitchell being the Jimi Hendrix of drums. Even though I think Keith definitely pushed the drums in so many directions that no one had, mm-hmm. I think Mitch Mitchell did that to a higher extent as well and took it that step further. Yeah, that, 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 that's how I always feel. I mean, uh, I remember John Joe saying... Um, before John Joe joined the trio, he didn't really kind of like delve into uh, Mitch's playing and all that. But obviously, when he joined the trio in 2012, uh, we were doing lots of uh, lots of Jimmy. You know, we were doing all kind of weird, obscure ones as well, like um, uh, "I Don't Live Today" and "Manic Depression" and stuff like that. And a lot of those drum beats are really, really mad. And um, John Joe said, like, uh, like you, if you think you come up, if you think you've come up with something new on the drums, Mitch Mitchell's already done it. And I love that line. And, um, and 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 again, for me, it's so true. It's like you know, I, if I listen to drummers now, I always kind of like I can hear certain things, and I'm like, well, Mitch already did that, you know. Um, crikey, crumbs. Okay, I'm getting a bit scared. Uh, go away, Kevin. It's like a train coming under the house. It is. It's like a tr- bloody steam engine going underneath. Anyway, um, but yeah, uh, I Mitch is my favorite drummer. Again, next is Mr. John Joe, and it's just. The man's just a monster, absolute monster. How he plays, and uh, again, like I say, uh, him and Jimmy were so perfect together, and you can see why Mitch was never Mitch after Jimmy passed. Because um, a lot of people say that. Like um, that, I remember watching an interview with Randy Hansen about Mitch Mitchell. Uh, it, they did a tour where. Um, Randy was obviously on guitar and Mitch was on the drums and I forget who was playing bass at that time. I don't think I don't know if it was that uh, UFO Walter or it was uh, or it was somebody else or Billy Cox. I don't remember, but it was a it was a Jimmy tour. Randy Hansen was on guitar and some of them, and Mitch played drums on it. And he said literally, Randy said like he expected the Mitch of old to be kind of like that, you know, a little you know absolute monster. And they started playing and Mitch was like. And Randy was like, what's going on here? Next gig, same thing. Next gig, same thing. Next gig, same thing. Of this run of dates they were doing. And he got to a point where Randy Hansen was just like, oh, what's going on? Just play the thing. And he, and he and apparently he went up to the drum, went up to Mitch's drum kit and he kicked the drum kit. And he said, play the drums. And it angered, it got Mitch, he got his back up. And so Mitch went, and all of a sudden, uh, Randy Hansen was like, yeah, it's the Mitch of old, he's there. And then the next gig he was back to. Because again, Jimmy was Mitch's best friend, like music and music partner. 
And after Jimmy went, Mitch just was not never the same. And you can see why. I mean, that, that kind of connection that they had, you're lucky if you get that once in your whole musical life. You know, uh, and and Mitch got it on such a high level, and they were so they complemented each other so well. Uh, Mitch and Jimmy, it's it, it, I can't imagine the heartbreak that man felt when Jimmy died. Uh, I really can't. And it was stuck. You know, it was just starting to get really kind of like comfortable as well. Jimmy was, you know, they were on. They were doing that tour. They were working on that new album. They had enough. They had enough songs. They were all working on it. Obviously, never got finished because Jimmy isn't there to finish them. I can't imagine what I did to Mitch's mindset, bless him. I really can't. It must have just absolutely messed him up. But um, and also, Mitch played with uh, uh, Gary Moore. Gary Moore did a, uh, a video. I think it, I think it's still on YouTube. I don't know. Jenny Hendrix could have had it removed by now. I don't know. But uh, Gary did a a night of Jimmy's songs, and he got at one point Billy Cox comes up and plays bass, and Mitch plays drums. And if you watch that, you can see how withdrawn Mitch is. He doesn't try. He just doesn't try. Uh, he just plays very simple, doesn't really do anything. And it's such a shame, And but I can kind of totally understand it at the same time. But Mitch is one of my favourite drummers. Like I say, next to Mr. John Joe Gaskin, Mitch is my favourite drummer. And But I get to play with John Joe. I, I'm never going to get to play with Mitch, sadly, but I get to play with John Joe, and it is literally the next best thing. So, um, yeah, I love Mitch. I love his drumming. I love his playing. I love the way he was. I love how he complimented Jimmy. Uh, it's just just a shame, really, that he is, went the way he went. But it is what it is. Um, but yeah, but Mitch to me is like the best drummer that has ever been, in my opinion. I know that's a very kind of like you know, but there's Virgil Donati, and I'm sure John Joe would argue on Virgil Donati. Um, because I think John Joe is a bit of love with Virgil yeah. Donati, isn't he? Uh, there's Virgil Donati, there's, uh, I say there's Keith Moon, there's Ginger Baker, there's... Um... And Ginger Baker thinks that about himself. And Ginger Baker does <laughs> think that about himself, constantly. <laughs> uh, and all these other things. Uh, I've got a story for you, actually, people tube. Lo and behold, tangent again. Uh, my friend Charlie, um, he, um, when he was growing up, he said he'd heard of a band, he had heard of a band Cream and how good they were and so when they came touring he went to see them we went to see them in the again in their prime in the 60s so Chai went to see them at this club and uh, Chai described it as this he said he went to the front and he said you had Jack Bruce there Ginger Baker there and Eric Clapton there and they were all playing different songs to each other and I was like that's brilliant <laughs> he said it was just a noise he said none of them were playing the songs. They were all just doing whatever they wanted to do. And funny enough, Eric Clapton talks about that in his autobiography. He's saying their egos got so big, they just did whatever they wanted. And, you know, to much to the sh- chagrin of, I think, of quite a few audiences. And uh, Chai just said, I didn't get it. And I can see why, if that was what was going on. And again, Eric said it. Uh, and he said, funny enough, Eric spoke, speaks in his autobiography. When Cream did their reunion gigs, he said the first Royal, the, the, the Royal Albert Hall gigs were really good. But he said by the time they got to Madison Square Gardens, he said the ego, the ego problem had re-emerged and it just ruined it. And he said that was it. At that point, it was game over. Uh, Eric Clapton's autobiography, by the way, for the I highly recommend reading it. It's absolutely amazing. Great book to read. Uh, massively interesting. So anyway, uh, yeah, so, uh, so anyway, I hope those questions are okay today. Thank you very much, Queenie, for being in this impromptu Thank you. A&Q thing. And uh, yeah, thank you very much indeed. Uh, if you want to submit a question for Anki Wednesday, description box below. If you like the channel, like the channel, like the video to do here, please consider becoming a patron at Patreon. Uh, other than that, build tube. I will see you for Les Paul Friday, uh, Gibson Les Paul Friday, and uh, yeah, I'll see you then. Until then, have a great morning, afternoon, good evening, and goodbye now. Goodbye from me, and goodbye from me, the bin dweller, <laughs> the bin weevil, the bin weevil. <laughs> That's a band name. <laughs> the Bin Weevils. Oh, changing the back. No, we are no longer the Simpson Trio. We are now the Bin Weevils. Okay. Goodbye, people. Thank you very much indeed for watching. See you again.